So you should all be seeing a welcome screen. And again, welcome to today's presentation. Um, we acknowledge that HSU is on the land of the Wiat peoples, which includes the Wiat tribe, Bear River Rancheria, and Blue Lake Rancheria. Arcata is known as Godini, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods. Wiat peoples continue to remain in relationship to these lands through ceremony, culture, and stewardship. They are important parts of not only the history of this area, but also in continuing the knowledge of this place. And by putting this slide up, it does compel me to educate myself, and I hope it will compel you to educate yourself more about um, the place meanings and acknowledging um, the peoples. This pres um, presentation will begin shortly. We ask you to keep yourself muted. And in today's meeting, we're asking you to please hold all of your questions until the end of the presentation. If you do want to ask a question and you do want to put it in the chat, we have the chat set up so that it will only go to one of the hosts or co-hosts, which is myself, Alex, and Vicki, and Sheila. So um, just so you know, that's how this, this meeting is set up today. Um, I also want to encourage you, if you're interested in taking any of our um, online classes or any of our in-person classes, if you can get registered as soon as possible, but at least three days before the start of um, the class, it helps us to make sure that we get you in your class. And I'm going to turn it over um, to my director, Sheila rocker Happy. She's got some an important message for you today. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, do, would you like me to share my screen or are you gonna keep it on yours? All right. And we have the same screen. So, um, so it's, uh, it should, should, be the, should be pretty seamless there. Um, I want to welcome you all today. Um, I'm Sheila rocker Heppy. I am the Director of Extended Education and the OLLI program at HSU. Um, and it is an exciting time to be, um, to be a lifelong learner. Um, and I think it's always an exciting time to be a lifelong learner. What's happening right now at Humboldt State University is this week, there will be going through quite a few changes. Um, the president and the vice president are meeting with uh, the trustees to talk about the transition from Humboldt State University to becoming Cal Poly Humboldt. And we've had some um, conversations about that in the past, but that's gonna mean some changes for Ollie at HSU as well. So um, when we're talking about the, um, let me go back. When we're talking about Ollie at HSU, you know us from these, uh, these free brown bag presentations that we provide on um, Monday afternoons. And that is made possible by our membership. Um, OLLI membership is um, an investment in our program and shows support for lifelong learning in our community. We offer the free brown bag lunches and we also offer um, a Let's Connect uh, weekly conversations with Tracy Barnes Priestley, among other things, including scholarships for folks to take classes. The way that the Osher Lifelong Learning Program works, or OLLI, is that OLLI at HSU is one of 124 OLLIs, or Lifelong Learning Institutes, across the nation. And we were given a, a special grant um, 16 years ago to try to develop an OLLI in Humboldt. And when they gave us the grant, they said, oh, you'll never have enough people. And enough people at that time was 500 members. You'll never have enough people to, um, to have a, a full uh, institute. And we did. This, uh, this slide here shows that the original goal was 500 members and we got 500 members and that gave us a million dollars endowment so that Ollie could live on at Humboldt State University uh, from, from now on in, in perpetuity. Uh, we get 5% of that um, endowment every year. So that's $50,000. But the planning grant that we had for the four years before that was $100,000 a year. And that pays for staff salaries so that none of, no Ollie um, <coughs> uh, salaries come from uh, our membership or our course fees. That's all covered under the endowment. So in order to get all the way up to a back up to $100,000, which is 5% of $2 million, we had to have a thousand members. And we did that from 2010 
to until 2020. Every year, we had a thousand people join um, OLLI as members. So what that means for membership is that we zero out every year on, Jan on July 1st. So June 30th is the last day of the year and July 1st is the first day of the year. And we zero out. And we do that because the Osher Foundation who gives us that endowment, they wanna make sure that we have a community that supports the Lifelong Learning Institute. And so we always have had that community. We've always had the membership until the pandemic hit and then things changed quite a bit. So if you look at our six month total um, for 2019-20 at six months, we were at 365 members. In 2020, when the pandemic hit, our six month total was 144 members. And this year it was 173 members. We've got to make a change in that. And the Osher Foundation has reached out to all at HSU. And I think about 120 of the other um, institutes across the nation and asked us to make sure that we reach out to our membership to say, please tell your friends to, um, to renew their membership and to make sure that we have indication that the community would like to retain a lifelong learning institute. A membership is $35 annually, and it's for, for folks who are 50 and better. Folks who are under 50 can take uh, can even become a member. They can take our classes and become a member, um, but we can only count folks who are over 50 in our, in our numbers. When we look at where our membership is today, when you look at the end of the year for 2019, 2020, we had 1,001 members, which gets us exactly to where we need to be for our, um, for our funding. In 2020, we dropped to half um, with the pandemic. And today in uh, January, we are at 485. And we would love to be able to get back up to our full membership at 1,000 before June 30th of this year. So my, my um, plea today is to, um, is to ask you to support Ollie through membership and have your friends, tell your friends about um, how important it is to you to have an Ollie at HSU or Ollie at Cal Poly Humboldt. We will be having some membership meetings to talk about some changes for Ollie and, um, and the, those invitations will be going out. As always, we wanna thank our friends of Ollie, the folks who are, um, are serve as leaders and who share resources beyond just the membership with Ollie at HSU. And that makes it possible for us to sponsor classes and to offer scholarships. Anyone who is a member is eligible to, for scholarships for up to two courses every term. And we have four terms a year. So that's something as well to please share and get the word out. As you know, Ollie's main role is to offer classes and they're classes that are um, designed specifically for the interest of our members. And with 489 or 1,000 members in the Humboldt community, we cannot go wrong. Every, the people in our membership are interested and interesting people. And we try the, the um, curriculum committee works together to uh, come to offer a catalogs full of incredible classes. So I welcome you to this um, presentation and I'm gonna turn it over to Jane. If you have any questions about Ollie, please just email us at ollie at humboldt.edu and we'd be happy to answer any questions um, and you can also join. Thanks a lot and on to you, Jane. I'm Jane Woodward and I'm on the curriculum committee for Ollie and I work together with others, including Kim and other members of the committee to um, put together this brown bag lunch program. We're always gathering ideas. And if you have ideas to do a presentation, you can go to uh, ollie at humboldt.edu and propose one. There's a proposal form. Um, and I wanna welcome you all. And, and in particular, Jean Pfizer, who is the author of Driven Out, The Forgotten War Against Chinese Americans and the forthcoming The Stolen People, A History of Slavery in California. She consulted and appeared in PBS 1882, The Chinese Exclusion Act, curated This Wide American Earth at the Smithsonian Museum of American History, and speaks regularly on issues of immigration on NPR and Pacifica Radio.
She's a member of the Eureka Chinatown Project and is a professor in English, Asian Studies, and Women and Gender Studies at the University of Delaware. We welcome Jean and look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you so much. It's all yours, Jean. Jean, you're muted. That's okay. better. <laughs> this is a new Zoom system for me. Hi, I'm Jeannie Felzer, and I've had a home in Big Lagoon for over 30 years. Humboldt is a huge part of my life. And thank you, Vicki, for inviting me and Sheila and Jane for making this possible for us to all talk together and meet together in this really sober moment of anti-Asian hate. And I think locally, we are speaking back to the anti-Asian hate through the Eureka Chinatown project, through the mural, which I hope you've seen in, in downtown Eureka, the monuments, there are two monuments. We've had incredible support from the city of Eureka. And we are now, and we scheduled this because we're now in the midst of starting Lunar New Year's, which is a time for Asian people to come together. And because of COVID, it's a very difficult time for families and communities to get together. So this is also in honor of Lunar New Year's and all of our need and wish to be in community with each other. I'm going to share my screen and Vicki, I might need a little bit of help here. Um, to keep me on the screen and my screen share. I don't know if I can do that at the same time. So I'm gonna share my screen, we'll see what happens. How are we doing? It looks like you need to put it into your, um slideshow mode play from beginning there we go perfect oh perfect you're still here i'm still here it's good we've asked you to put your questions um into chat because we're just an uncommonly large number of people and that way we'll um we'll be able to get people's questions answered and we can always meet again. I like to think of this history as no longer buried alive. Um, and how to tell the story of the birth of Asian America and is there really such a place as Asian America? When we think of those of us who are not first people, who are not indigenous people, all of us came from somewhere. And maybe to take a second to think about what made your people um, move thousands of miles, cross seas, be forced to come here in slave ships, to, like my family, leave their family, their village, poverty, their faith community, and their history. But this isn't only a victim story and the story I'll tell today and trying to focus as much as possible on Humboldt County. This is a story of resistance and rebellion. And I'll just start with saying that the Chinese Americans in Humboldt County filed the first lawsuit for reparations, I believe in the United States, certainly in California. And we'll talk about that they organized the first general strike in California. They bought arms from China. They were not about to be assaulted and attacked. And at the same time, they kept up their cultural traditions, their food practices. We have logs of the Chinese people in Humboldt County buying dried fish and dried fruit. Um, 
and rice and starting growing rice in California to keep their food practices and traditions true to themselves. What did they face here? What were the indications that they were welcome? Um, what are indications that we have now that immigrants are welcome? Um, are there jobs? Are people safe? Are they entitled to citizenship? Um, are they welcome to marry? And are they welcome to marry within their community and outside their community? What do immigrants want? Do they intend to assimilate? Um, do they intend, as most of the Chinese Americans do, did, more like affiliate, to affiliate with this country and yet keep their communities healthy and alive? What does patriotism mean to an immigrant when you're not allowed to vote or you're not allowed to send your kids to school or you can be yanked out of your car as you're driving your kids to school? How do you resist as an immigrant? And if you're an undocumented immigrant, or if you're somebody who's been kidnapped in the border and trafficked to come here, um, how do you protect yourself? And how do you fight back for your community? How do you get naturalized? And what a weird term to mean being a citizen is to be naturalized, like that makes you natural, very weird. The Chinese Americans who came to California and who came to Humboldt County faced exclusion, being driven out. Um, they were victimized. They were the Chinese in California. The women were raped. They were kidnapped. They were sold. Los Angeles had the largest mass lynching in American history. The Chinese people with an act of 1892 were forced to wear photo identity cards and carry them on their person. Um, this was a tradition left over from slavery. Um, enslaved African Americans in the South needed identity cards to move around in the South. And Native Americans in the 1850s were also forced to prove that they, quote, weren't vagrant, that they were employed or owned or indentured to someone. Now, all of us in our new barcodes on our driver's licenses, for the first time in a totally mass way for all of us, we're carrying around photo identity cards. And this is a tradition when we go to get our driver's licenses renewed that started with slave, with the slave pass. So I think it's really important that we link ourselves to the histories that we're talking about. Um, for me, the question was, where do Chinese Americans leave their footprints? How did I find, how did I tell their story? How did I make a patchwork quilt of a history that I found across, across California. Um, and what is the relationship of Chinese Americans to some of the nationalism that's going on right now? This is a very complicated time for Asian Americans. And we can even ask who is Asian American? Chinese American, Japanese American, Hmong, Vietnamese, Thai, Filipino, all of these groups of people live in Humboldt County and work here and have had very different experiences of being here. What I believe is that these ethnicities are not an identity, they're a process and that people change and they affiliate um, 
with their host countries, their home countries, their new countries in many different ways. And they've got to move like a flash to be able to stay safe, to participate, to work, to create their music, their food practices, and protect their families. So what I found was an incredibly rebellious subjectivity. Um, the immigrants who came to Humboldt County were on alert. They had come from somewhere else, um, somewhere else in California. Very few came straight to Humboldt County. The Chinese called what happened to them in Humboldt County, the Pai Kwa, or the driven out. And this ideogram, this calligraphy was painted to represent the driven out. Uh, a friend of our old librarians at Humboldt State, Ray Wang, had a friend of his paint it for my book. And people read it in many different ways. If we open this up for questions to everybody, everybody here would have a different reading of this ideogram. But the left part is to indicate the hand, the, um, the push, the drive, the drive out, the Chinese American. And the right ideogram um, is the out, the driven out, which looks like a sword. And it suggests the violence that happened here. This is a poem that was found and the painted on the walls of Angel Island. And Angel Island was a detention center. It was opened as the detention centers are now to house um, people who wanted to enter the country and people stayed on Angel Island and the ancestors of some of the people who are here today stayed on Angel Island, everything from a couple of days to two years. And I'm just gonna read it because I want as much as possible for people to be able to tell their own story. And something's in front of me. Originally, I had intended to come to America last year. This poem was painted on the, in the men's section on the wall and carved into the wall of the Angel Island Detention Center. Originally, I had intended to come to America last year. Lack of money delayed me until early autumn. It was on the day that the Weaver Maiden met the cowherd that I took passage on the President Lincoln. I ate wind and tasted waves for more than 20 days. Fortunately, I arrived safely on the American continent. I thought I could land in a few days. How was I to know I would become a prisoner suffering in the wooden building? The barbarian's abuse is really difficult to take. When my family circumstances stir my emotions, a double stream of tears flow. I only wish I can land in San Francisco soon, thus sparing me this additional sorrow here. As we talk today, I just want to remind people that on Thursday, there will be a celebration of Fred Carmazzo, the Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution. And it's going to be a Zoom presentation. We're gifted to have the speaker, Stan Yogi, um, who will talk about the past is always present. And he will talk about what happened to Japanese Americans who, like the Chinese Americans, were interned in horrible camps, um, accused of being aliens, accused of being enemies. And so I just want to start with talking about Stan Yogi's speech. He's an amazing um, intellect. So in August, you'd have to rewind way, way back when, in 1974, with my six-year-old daughter, I moved into a cabin in the woods in Big Lagoon in remote Humboldt County, California, to begin my career 
as a professor of American studies. From Big Lagoon, a little community of empty beach cottages, damp in the gray light of a North Coast winter, daily I drove south. Past, um, I'm sorry, daily, past the jagged rocks of Patrick's Point, through the fishing village of Trinidad, past sober white egrets guarding the green fern prairies, the egrets oblivious as I was not yet to the 65 inches of rain which fall each year in the county. Finally driving across the Mad River to climb the hill to Humboldt State University in Arcata, nestled in the redwoods between Oregon and the lumber fishing town of Eureka, HSU borders the marshes that fade into Humboldt Bay. In 1974, then as now, HSU had an unusual mix of white and tribal students. But in my classes, in the hallways of Founders Hall, at meetings across the campus, demanding that hoopah myth and history be included in a sequence I was hired to teach in the American frontier and at nightly peace rallies that happened across the county, I noticed the complete absence of Asian kids. I was born in LA, I grew up in California. This didn't look like the California I knew. So I started asking about the missing students and many people didn't know, some had not noticed. But I heard from a local poet that Chinese parents then would not send their kids to HSU because 100 years ago, all the Chinese had been driven out of the county. Troubled, I moved on to the library where I found one old article that verified that the lumber and fishing town of Eureka, the county seat, had indeed purged all its Chinese residents in 1885. I was hired as new PhDs are in every possible contingent, you know, assistant, sabbatical replacement, temporary adjunct, all these words. Um, so I couldn't stay at Humboldt. And we'd also made a bit of a fuss because there were no women authors at all being taught in the English department at HSU. So maybe it was time to leave. And I took a permanent job at the University of California, San Diego. And in that confident, confident era, I began to write about utopia. But then as now, I was haunted by the Roosevelt Elk foraging in the placid lagoons, the light slicing the fog banks over the Pacific and the missing Asian kids. How to find this untold history of racism that took place in this ethereally beautiful place where for hundreds of years before the lumber companies arrived, the Eurox called it Oketo, a still, there where it is calm. I return each year, but as with other places of great beauty, I was disturbed by the history of violence that I believe is embedded in the landscape. And in my mind, the dissonance between the land and its history would not go away. 30 years and four books later, I decided, decided to find the Asian kids. On the first day of my quest, I went down to Berkeley and then rolling a cloudy, crappy microfilm reader at the Bancroft Library on the front page of the Alta California, then the major Californian newspaper. I quickly discovered that more than one event was at stake. There goes Seattle, there goes Tacoma, there goes San Jose, Truckee, Fresno. Later, the archives would reveal to me over 240 towns. From Seattle to Oregon, to California, to the Rocky Mountains, from the Canadian border, down through the arid Central Valley to the N-word Alley in Los Angeles, which was Chinatown. 
There are over 200 dots on this map. I know because I had to go back to Office Depot and buy more dots to make the map. And so I began, I began to follow the footsteps of thousands of Chinese people who were violently gathered, loaded onto railroad cars or steamers, forced onto logging rafts, marched out of town or killed. This is a sign um, I found at the Historical Society in Crescent City. A mass meeting of the citizens of this place and vicinity will be held at Darby's Hall. This is from 1886. This event was a celebration, an annual celebration and another purge in Humboldt County for what happened in Eureka. Here's where I found the stories. Um, from the Oakland Museum, I found photographs of white and Chinese miners once working together, yet symbolically and ominously divided by the long tom, by the trough. Um, I think this is a really interesting image and I look at it a lot of the white miners appearing to come more forward, stare at the count, at the camera more comfortably, and the Chinese miners on the other side more receding into the image and not having control in their hands in this photograph of the tools. They're further away from the long tom and the mining pans and the shovels. And yet, this is why the first generation of Chinese Americans came to California. There are two stories of Chinese Americans in California, very, very different stories. And we'll talk about that in a bit. The men chose to come here. They came freely. They came the way my dad and my grandpa and their ancestors came. They chose to come. And like my family, they borrowed money to come or they were seen as likely to survive and a family got together and donated money or they borrowed money from the merchant class. It's a different story for the Chinese women. Over 95 to 90 percent of the first Chinese American women to come to this country were kidnapped from the coast of Guangdong and brought here and sold as enslaved prostitutes. These are the men. They were immediately attacked. The, they were charged, first the Chileans, the Argentinians, and then the Chinese were charged a separate foreign miners tax just for the right to mine on land that was open, land that was free. Um, and they were charged and they realized they were targeted. Sometimes they were able to forge these tax papers, but mainly tax collectors were riding through the gold country, collecting taxes from the Chinese. Chile sent a boat to bring their miners back. Um, the Chinese miners decided to stay. But when the foreign miners tax kept going up and up and up to $20 a month, that's when many of the gold miners came down from the mountains and started settling in communities. And those were the first Chinatowns in California. The Chinese, when they arrived, were searched for opium. This is an image from Harper's Magazine of the Chinese being strip searched. The women were strip searched too. And the girls who were brought enslaved were compelled to carry on their body packets of opium um, to be sold in the United States. Opium was a legal drug at the time. And it was advertised. Um, it was sold in lots of different ways. It was advertised in the women's magazines, the white women's magazines as laudanum, a tincture that was drunk. And it was kind of the 19th century Valium. This is the beginning of the purges that we've come to worry about 
This was Chinatown in Los Angeles. Um, it was named the N-word alley. It had been built over the old Latino community um, in downtown. It's very close to where the train station is in, in downtown LA. During my years of working on Driven Out, I traveled to most of these towns. Some of the towns were really eager to get their story told, to uncover their story. Some were even relieved and would bring out hidden, filed away scrapbooks and letters and photographs and diaries. Others denied the story I already knew had happened. And I got into the generic hamburger, um, I was traveling with my sister-in-law who worked at the Oakland Museum and she would just flash her Indiana smile and say, mm, I think I really want a hamburger. We'll be back in a couple of hours. And we would leave. And often when we came back, there were full library tables covered with the archives we were, we were looking for. What happened in Los Angeles, it's 1871, and 17 Chinese men and one or two Chinese women were lynched. There had been a wedding between um, two different groups of Chinese people, and there was a little bit of a scuffle, and all of a sudden, word goes out there's a riot in Chinatown, which wasn't happening. And farmers and ranchers working in the orange groves surrounding LA rushed into Chinatown and they started to burn Chinatown and they hung the Chinese American um, men and some women from whatever they could from wagon posts and gate posts and steeples and rooftops. And the Chinese fought back. Um, one Chinese woman climbed out of a hole that had been chopped in her roof. She climbs out through this hole and starts, Chinese woman starts firing back on the mob. One day I get a phone call um, from a woman. She says, you don't know me. I'm the librarian at the LA County Library and I have something I think you wanna see. And she mailed me this picture. And these are the bodies that have been cut down after the lynching. This is the jail yard in the, in the jail in Los Angeles. And the bodies from the lynching have been cut down and being waited to be claimed and identified by their families for burial. This was Chinatown, the first Chinatown in Sacramento. The Chinatowns in San Jose were burned over and over again. Five times they were burned. This is an image, um, it's a photograph. The camera was very common by then. This is also in the 1880s. And after Chinatown was burned to the ground five times, the Chinese rebuild on the lot right across the street from City Hall. And almost like the story um, that we know from when we were kids, this time they're gonna rebuild out of bricks. So their Chinatown cannot be burned again. And they leave very small doors into their brick Chinatown so that they could guard who came in and who left. And they were harassed. Um, the police busted into Chinatown and arrested people at the brothels or at the gambling dens, the same things that were happening in San Jose as a whole um, were also happening within Chinatown, but the cops were busting the people who were at the gambling dens. Um, and the Chinese filed the first lawsuit that I'm aware of for police harassment. And they won. 
This brings our story home. This is Chinatown in Eureka. Some of you may know the story of what happened in Eureka, um, but on Lunar New Year's, on then you know, Lunar New Year's follows a different calendar, but on Lunar New Year's, the Chinese people who lived in this one square block on um, fifth between F and G, fifth and fourth, it was one square block. The Chinese in Eureka were not allowed to own property. This property was owned, if you, I don't have a pointer, but if you look up, um, it was owned by Riggs who owned the palace stables. And these were slums, they were tenements. And when they built the sidewalk that you see, or the wooden sidewalk, it blocked out the flow of sewage out of Chinatown. And so in the middle of this square block of shacks of tenement houses was kind of a cesspool and people knew that ducks were swimming in the cesspool. And if you've seen the beautiful mural painted by David Kim for the mural festival in Eureka, you'll see the incredible duck. And that is in honor of the Chinese people, of Chinese food, of, the, of what happened to them on this block. And the mural was right outside of Chinatown. And this alley is being renamed in honor of the one of the few Chinese people who stayed in Eureka, managed to stay in Eureka and in Humboldt County after the purge. What happened that night is that the Chinese knew Lunar New Year's was coming and in Humboldt County, they knew that gamblers were going to come up from Chinatown in San Francisco and cause trouble. And the Chinese people in Humboldt turned to the police and they say, we want the same protection everybody else has. And we need you to protect us because there's going to be some violence possibly over Lunar New Year's. The police ignored the Chinese request for help and indeed, there was a shootout. Um, in the shootout, likely, although we don't know for sure, between two Chinese men, a stray bullet killed a member of the city council, a guy named David Kendall. And that starts a huge rage. Within hours, 600 people, white people, meet at what was then Centennial Hall. It had built, built 1776, the centennial of the Declaration of Independence. It was named Centennial Hall. 600 people gather in downtown Eureka and decide what to do. The first um, proposal was to kill all the Chinese people. There were about 300 Chinese Americans living in Eureka at the time. And it was a very Christian era. People didn't really like the idea of killing 300 Chinese people. And then the second proposal is burn Chinatown. But Riggs, who was out of town, the landlord says, mm, you can't burn Chinatown because it's mine. So don't burn my buildings down. So the third proposal passes, and it's to give the Chinese people, all of them in Eureka, 24 hours to leave Chinatown. So on that cold and foggy and dreary February night of February 5th, all of the people of Chinatown pack. And they're loading whatever you can pack. Can you imagine what you would take? I mean, now with the fires, we all go through this. What would we take if we had to leave quickly? And they had really just one night, the sheriff had commandeered wagons and the street is lined with these wagons and just shoving Chinese people belongings into the wagons. 
And somewhere in the middle of night at about three or four in the morning, the sheriff and the vigilantes start to march the Chinese people down to the wharf and they wait at the wharf, the wharf we all love to go to, to fish and to buy crab and ice cream and to shop and work. Um, that's where they were gathered in a warehouse and they're waiting for the tide to come out. Normally there was daily ships sailing between San Francisco and Eureka. And because of the bad tides, there were two ships in the harbor. This is one of them, the city of Chester. And there was another one, the Humboldt that looks just like this. And 300 people and their belongings, women, children, men, um, were loaded onto these two ships and they wait for the tide to come out. And finally, um, so they're loaded in the warehouse, they're being taken out to the ships on barges. And finally, the tide is going to sail across the shoal. We know we have a very narrow opening for Humboldt Bay, and they're going to be shipped down to San Francisco on these two ships. And there was no sense of keeping families together. They were just loaded on the ships. What they left behind was so much. Little bits of it still remain. The Clark has little pieces of pottery, but they couldn't take the heavy Chinese mahogany furniture. They obviously couldn't take their fishing boats, their shrimp boats. They couldn't take the plants that were just in the ground, which were their livelihood. Um, Humboldt thrived on the, um, the vegetables grown by the Chinese people. They sailed down to San Francisco. It was a Sunday night, the wind was from the north and they land in San Francisco before the custom house is open. They climb off the ship and rush to San Francisco's Chinatown. And at three o'clock that afternoon in this act of given the weekend, the purge, the packing, finding their people, they regroup at one of the Chinese merchant societies and they make a historic announcement. And they say, someone will have to pay for the violence that was done to us. And they make the announcement that they're gonna sue the city of Eureka for being the victims of mob violence. And it's that language, being the victims of mob violence, that turns this from a simple tort action where you demand money for something that's happened to you like in a car accident um, into a demand for reparations. They lose the lawsuit. The lawsuit is called Wing Hing v. the city of Eureka. They lose the lawsuit because the judge says that they didn't pay taxes. There's no tax records of what they owned because they didn't own land. And he devalues everything else that the Chinese people owned. It's important for us to hold on to the fact that of the 52 people who filed that lawsuit, two of them were enslaved Chinese girls. The courage for them to sign on to this lawsuit, to demand reparations for what was done to them by the city of Eureka is pretty phenomenal. It was a scary night. We can point out, and the Clark Museum is doing these wonderful walking tours of Chinatown, where a gallows was. The white people of um, Eureka built a gallows, and we've heard different things. There's no image, but there was some kind of a dummy or a doll that was hung as a threat to really get out um, from the gallows. It was a terrifying night. Um, one of the vigilante gangs found a Chinese man in the white part of town and they threw a noose over his head and he had gone to say goodbye to his minister 
um, who was the Congregationalist minister. And the minister follows his friend down to the gallows, climbs onto the gallows and tries to talk the mob down. Um, and he isn't able to, the route, the purge of the Chinese people goes on. And that morning he goes down to the wharf looking, the minister goes down to the wharf looking for his friend and all he could give him or all he did give him was an umbrella and some, um, some gloves. So there's history to this. China had just paid America $700,000 after anti-American riots um, at the Christian min missions in Canton. And it was very clear that now it was America's turn to pay up. And the Chinese from Eureka sue for $132,000. I know you can't read this, but it's so historic. I just wanted to put this slide up. Anyhow, this is the lawsuit. Wing Hing v. the city of Eureka, plus 52 others. Humboldt County celebrates. From town to town in Humboldt County, the purges went on. Crescent City, um, Arcata, Fortuna, um, town after town, as you've seen on the map, especially in the one year celebration of the purge, um, purges the Chinese until there are very few left. The Karuk tribe up in the mountains was working with Chinese men who were miners and the Karuk hide the Chinese and they remain um, in those mountains with the Karuk people. And there's this amazing evidence that they were there like logs from the general store and Chinese coins. Um, so there is evidence that the Chinese remain in Humboldt County um, 25 years at least after the Chinese, after the city chamber of commerce publishes this brochure. This is a recruiting bro brochure. Please move to Humboldt County. Humboldt County needed people, it needed workers, and come for the resources, the climate, um, the scenery, and it promises the only county in the state containing no Chinamen. This are these are the men who purge the people, the Chinese people, they were mainly railroad workers who are purged from Tacoma, Washington, and they're marched nine miles along the railroad tracks to a junction, and there they wait, and they wait, and they wait. These men are the governor of Washington, the mayor of Tacoma, the mayor of Seattle, the city fathers, and they organize the purge in Tacoma, and the Tacoma, one of the reasons we have so much history is that the Tacoma, the Chinese from Tacoma, sue the government of the United States. Washington was still a territory, so there was no state to sue. So they sue Congress and they win as a part of a class settlement over $500,000, half a million dollars in reparations for being the victims of the mob violence. After Humboldt happened, people are freaked out by the violence and they come up with, other towns come up with different ways to get rid of the Chinese. In Truckee, the answer was to starve them out. And it took about six weeks and you were not allowed to buy, sell, hire, rent or have any quote social intercourse with any Chinese person. Most of the Chinese people around Truckee, for those of you who know it, um, there's a lot of wood. And the, most of the Chinese up around Truckee were woodcutters cutting wood for the railroad that they had helped build. 
How did they do it? What were the other ways? This is a Chinese laundry. Like most of the laundries, it was built on a creek. And one of the local laws was that you couldn't have a laundry in a wood building. That was illegal. And of course, most of everything in Northern California was built out of wood. So it meant you had to starve, you couldn't work. Um, laundry was not a Chinese tradition, but when they're driven out of the gold rush country by vigilantes, in some places with a brass band accompanying the purges, they take up the same work that other immigrants do, which actually my grandfather did too, which is to go into the service sector and like my grandfather, they opened laundries, they opened restaurants, they opened boarding houses um, to serve the new growing community. Another law, and this image is from Humboldt County, is that you weren't allowed to deliver vegetables in anything that hung over a foot off of your shoulders. And the Chinese had the poles with the baskets. This is what kept um, vegetables in Humboldt County were the Chinese gardeners and it broke them. If you can't um, deliver anything off of a long pole, there was no way to deliver your food. In San Francisco, the Chinese were not allowed to deliver laundry or food in wagons. So it became a way to shut them, to shut their work down and starve them out. Why did it happen? This is a very racist cartoon. It, this is the era of Darwin, the era of evolution. And so the evolution moves from the monkey into the figure of the pig, which was the Chinese, um, the slam, the slur on Chinese people was to call them pigs. And so, this is a different image of evolution. There was a great deal of fear of intermarriage and interracial sex. This is from sheet music at the Library of Congress. It's called The Wedding of the Chinese and the Coon. And it was one of my big mistakes as a historian because when I looked at the cover, it seemed so racist and actually published wrongly about this, of the figure of the African-American dandy marrying the very petite Asian woman um, with the wedding being performed by a kind of Uncle Tom figure. And I wrote about it as a very stereotyped and racist image of sheet music. In fact, it was one of the first musical comedies written by Billy Johnson and Bob Cole, who were African-American. It was one of our first um, musical comedies. And once I looked at the lyrics, it said, come to a wedding. This is a wedding you will never be, you have never been at before. It's the wedding between an African-American and an Asian woman and come celebrate this wedding. This is a cap gun um, and it was a child's gun. I think teach our children well, it was small. It's about this big. There are a few of them left, the Smithsonian has one. And as the child pulled the trigger, the Irishman, um, there was a great fascination with mechanical toys then. And the Irishman raises his foot and kicks the Chinese man in the butt and the cap would go off with an explosion in the cap gun. It's important for us to remember that in Red Bluff, there was an anti-Chinese children's parade. Um, so here also the Irishman is pulling on the Chinese man's cue. White people were obsessed with Chinese men's cues. They, um, they would pull them off. If they were arrested, they cut them off. The Chinese won a historic lawsuit at the US Supreme Court 
for having their queue cut off at the San Francisco County Jail as cruel and unusual punishment. And of why the queue? It was feminine, white women wore their hair, most women wore their hair in very long braids and it attacked the Chinese men in a kind of homophobia for being um, queer. And it was also obviously a kind of sexual symbol of castration to cut the cue off. Um, I'm having a problem because my slides are frozen. Vicki, can you help? Um, I'm not sure, uh, Kim. It looks like it went I'm, ahead. I'm back. Okay. I, mean, I don't have all of you, but the slideshow is back. Um, another way was to the only was to attack Chinese people for competing with white labor. It only happened in one industry, and that was in the cigar rolling industry. This is an ad for cigars made by white labor. And the ad says, purchase no cigars unless you can see the white label and factory number 31 on each box. Stop smoking so-called white labor cigars with no label on the box. On and after this date, every cigar bought from me will have the white label made by white labor. The Chinese were um, accused of smoking opium and selling opium and eating rats. If you can look at both parts of this image at once, it's called a picture for employers, why hire only white people? White working class life didn't look this good. You have the little boy, the little girl, little boys kind of torturing the kitty with the string. Um, and the white wife is holding up the clean white baby as the nice, chubby, healthy, white working man comes through the door, I'm home, honey. Um, but the image of Chinese labor is this very erotic, tangled um, Chinese people eating rats, stoned out on opium with their legs entwined around each other. I wanna speak just briefly to this business of the eating rats. There was tremendous hunger and people ate whatever they could. People ate squirrels and rodents and whatever they could find, especially in the 1870s with the mass national depression. I wanna take a couple of minutes and I know I'm running out of time but, and I wanna leave some time for questions, but this is the girl's story. The, this is a slave den up, it, up in Bakulumne Hill, um, the Chinese girls, a slave building in the 1850s where girls were bought and sold at auction. So these slave dens that we associate with the US South were happening up in the Sierras. This is a Chinese prostitute from Humboldt County. It's dated 1885, so it would have been right before the purge. And this is not a typical immigrant picture. Um, in fact, it would have been seen as very lewd at the time. Everything is wrong with this picture. It's a studio photo. It's not a headshot. Um, her feet were bound, so she would not have been a poor woman. Um, because you can't work with bound feet. Um, and she's in this very sexy odalesque pose. She's also, or someone put a pot of, giraffe, of um, chrysanthemums next to her. White chrysanthemums at the time were a Chinese image for purity. Was this a carte de visite? Was it a sales card promising to sell a virgin? Or did she put them there to reclaim her own purity. Who paid for this picture? Why was it taken? This is Jackson Street in San Francisco. This is where most of the Chinese girls were sold from. 
They were sold from caged windows and cages in brothels that lined um, Jackson Street that ran from Merchant San Francisco to Chinatown. And um, they were owned by the Chinese merchant class and they would beckon a customer through the window and there would be curtains, the door would be unlocked, the girl would service the customer, um, the pimp or madam would collect the money and then she would be locked in again. Many of these girls were on contracts and the contracts could go for typically four to 10 years. Uh, the deal was is that most of them did not outlive a four year contract from rape, assault, opium, um, and um, being beaten up and starved. So very few of them outlived their contract. But I believe that the two Chinese women up in Humboldt County had fled from the dens in San Francisco. So when they ran away, they would be, when they were purged and put on the Chester or the Humboldt, they would be returned to the site of their enslavement in San Francisco. This is a statement by a Chinese woman named Yok Lin, and she was from Sonora. Her husband's been arrested. And she said, my name is Yok Lin, and she describes she has a mole on her face, a scar on her face. Her husband, Charlie Jones, is in jail, and she is saying, I am a free woman. No man may ever own me again. I talked about the photo identity cards. This is one from Hawaii, where I couldn't find any from Humboldt County. More and more of them are surfacing. Um, but this was to prove that she was in the country legally. In 1882, there are a few laws that are really important to remember. The first is the Page Act of 1875 that says, no lewd women can enter the United States. That meant Chinese women. 1882 is the Chinese Exclusion Act that bans Chinese from entering or if they've left to go home to, to come back. And there were 110,000 Chinese people in the United States. 107,000 Chinese people refused to sign the photo identity cards. For a time, China is backing this effort. It is the most, it's the largest mass civil disobedience to date in the United States. Finally, the Chinese have to sign because China stops backing them up. They want a trade deal with the United States. This is a little boy also, Fui Kui, he's also from why I want to finish with the last episode in Humboldt County. Um, in 1906, a few Chinese men are brought down to the Eel River to set up a seasonal fish cannery on the river. And immediately the Chinese are back, the Chinese are back and groups gather to have fundraisers, they have dances, they sell ice cream to raise money to pay out the Chinese contracts. The Chinese refuse to leave until their contracts are paid. I wanted you to see this picture because it's a picture of mechanization and it's how the um, salmon are butchered and the machine is called the iron chink. The Chinese are rounded up from the Eel River and taken back to Eureka, forced back to Eureka, but they refuse to leave until their contract is paid and they're kept on Tuluat Island. And there was a short haul railroad that ran supplies and coal up and down Tuluat and the Chinese are kept in box cars. You can see a little girl all dressed up staring at the Chinese in the boxcar. For me as a Jewish person, this is a very compelling and horrifying image as well. Um, 
of the people stored in boxcars until a ship arrives and the Chinese are loaded onto barges, the Chinese who were working on the eel. But this time they've been paid and they're being shipped out to a ship that will take them back to Astoria, Oregon. Um, it had been a six month contract and they're in and out, fully paid in two weeks. So thank you very much for listening. I wanna remind you of Thursday, the Fred Korematsu day. Um, with Stan Yogi speaking. And if you want to get a copy of Driven Out, you want to hear more, you want to get in touch with me, Northtown is carrying um, Driven Out. And also you can get it from your, um, whatever your favorite online store is. Thank you very much for listening. And um, Vicki, I'm going to, try and shut this down and there we go. And we'll take some questions. Thank you very much. Vicki, it's to you. Um, okay, so if people have questions for Jeannie, if you could put them in the chat, that would be great. And I thought Jeannie, maybe while we're waiting for some questions, do you wanna talk about the return? of Chinese people or Chinese Americans to Humboldt? Sure. Um, right now, we believe there are about 1,600. Vicki, you can correct me if I'm wrong. We believe there are about 1,600 Asian Americans um, living in Eureka and Humboldt County. And for the past year, this amazing community, the Eureka Chinatown Project has been gathering to, um, to honor the Chinese who've returned and honor and celebrate the return of a very healthy and growing Asian, Asian American community. There is the mural on um, Fifth Street, Fifth and H, is that right, Vicki? Uh, fifth, uh, it's in on, off of East Street between Fourth and Fifth. And there will be a monument There'll be two monuments, one by the wharf and one by the, um, not the bank, the... Um, well, it's at the corner of um, 4th and E. Yeah. At, and the land has been donated. The clerk is having walking tours and the city of Eureka has unanimously voted to rename the alley that ran along Chinatown um, in honor of Charlie Moon, um, who was one of the few Asian Americans who remained after the purge. Um, and the Moon family is enormous and has been incredibly helpful and involved in this um, restoration and finding and celebration of the Asian community in Humboldt County. Are there questions? Uh, we don't have any questions uh, yet. So if anybody has um, anything. Vicki, I, I have a couple questions came my way. Oh, okay. uh, so, so first, Jeannie, I want to tell you that there are um, also a lot of people have been saying thank you for all this information and thank you so much. What a wealth of knowledge that you have shared. Um, and then I, the one question that I see in, in the chat is um, regarding the Chinese prostitute picture that you shared. Um, the question is, how sure are you that this woman is a prostitute? Is there, and what kind of proof do, do you have to, to identify her that way? Yeah, sure. I think you're thinking of the first one, the woman on the lounge, the woman in, it's a little more non-negotiable. I first got this picture from a, um, photographic, a Humboldt photographic historian, Peter Palmquist, who collected it and he identified it. He did a lot of work on the history of photography in California and the West. And so far, everything I found, he's never been wrong. And he identified this, um, Peter Palmquist did, as a Chinese prostitute, Humboldt County, 1885. Um, and also, 
why I believe it's a prostitute, of course, she's not here to tell her own story. Although we're now finding testimony um, from the girls who were Chinese prostitutes, I just found in the past year that a Chinese, that 22 Chinese girls who were dragged off a boat and arrested for coming into the country illegally sue for their right to stay in the country. And Chui Li, um, the lawsuit is filed in her name. And in that lawsuit, they win birthright, which means if you have been born in this country, you are a US citizen, regardless of your ancestry, your immigrate, your parents' immigration status, that this Chinese prostitute goes to the US Supreme Court and wins the status um, of birthright, which so many hundreds of thousands of people are turning to, to enter and stay in the country. Um, I'm, my parents were not, my dad was not born in this country. So I would have been one of those birthright kids um, with no idea of my debt to this Chinese prostitute who fights and wins. I think she's a Chinese prostitute, one, because I really trust Peter Palmquist as a historian who some of you may remember, he tragically died in a hit and run. Um, also, it's a very lewd image. I, I would waste a lot of time putting it back up. Women in the 1880s didn't show their legs. They weren't photographed with their legs showing. They weren't taking that, you know, languishing, laid back, arm over your head. This was an odalesque pose. It would have been seen as very erotic at the time. These are not the images that Chinese people are sending back to China. I worked with the Chinese Railroad Workers Project out of Stanford, and we came upon hundreds of photographs of um, the Chinese people were sending back to China because it was a project working with certain um, Chinese museums and Chinese villages. And there's no other photograph that looks like that. Um, it's just a very erotic come hither pose. And again, because I do trust Peter Palmquist as an outstanding local historian. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, another question has come to me is, has the animus continued against the Chinese and do we have anti-Chinese incidents happening today? We all saw on TV last week, the Asian woman who was pushed off the tracks um, on the New York subway that just some, she was standing waiting for the subway and she was pushed off the tracks and killed onto, on, you know, on the, on the subway. Um, Chinese kids are being targeted. Um, they're mocked by their facial features, by traditions of education, by size, um, by skin color, um, by access to jobs, by limits on the number of Chinese kids in, in a particular school. Um, there is a tremendous amount of um, targeting of young Chinese girls to be human trafficked right now on the idea that Chinese women are um, more quote exotic, which just means otherness or difference. It's really the anti-Chinese violence and it's going to come back um, it sometimes ebbs and flows with our relations with China um, and it's coming back in the immigration laws. So it's a very precarious time for Chinese people in this country who are subject to real um, physical abuse. Um, and somebody just posted their daughter has experienced a lot of racism. She was adopted from China and the adopted Chinese kids, many of whom are girls, um, are facing a whole different kind of targeting. And we're all aware 
from our own experiences and our kids of the brutality of bullying and the pain that that can cause in the schools. And of course the, the you know, the event that really raised all of our consciousness about, about the anti-Chinese hate was the murder of the Chinese women at the spa who may well have just been massage workers. We really still do not know um, the murder at the two spas in Atlanta of the Asian women. And there is no reason it took two weeks for us to know their names, their countries of origins, or what happened to them. I mean, there was a real, in my mind at least, silencing of who they were as individual people, not just the crime against them to return their reality and their humanity to all of us. It's a really important question. And um, I think the presence of at least 1600 Asian Americans in Humboldt County is going to be a buffer in itself. And the friendliness, the welcome, the strength and brilliance of this group that within under a year um, has earned the respect of the county who is really, um, and the mayor of Eureka. So far that group has been pretty much focused on Eureka and I think we'll be moving out to some of the other experiences in other parts of the county to mark this history as well. It's a very don't mess with me image um, and honor us and we're here that's coming through in that image. Other questions? Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat that came to me. I don't know, Vicki, if you have some now. Uh, yes, I did get a question. Um, Jeannie, did many of the Chinese, such as the minors, speak English? Eventually, all migrants to this country learn English. You know, I mean, this um, English first stuff, to my mind, is a really precarious, um, you know, English is the dominant language that a lot of the customers, their clients, um, when they opened restaurants and laundries and groceries and interacted with the white community, they learned English. Um, the one of the most uh, a name for all of us to remember is Mamie Tate, who opened the San Francisco school system to Chinese kids, starting with her own kids. And when the Smithsonian did the exhibit on Brown v. the Board of Education, we were able to get the Smithsonian to mount an exhibit about Mamie Tate and her opening the um, schools in San Francisco to Chinese kids. In the end, Mamie Tate didn't send her kids to the public school because of the bullying, and she didn't think they were going to get a very good education. They were kind of marked after that. But she should be up there with Brown v. the Board of Education. Yeah, but all immigrants eventually, um, what, whatever country they go to, will learn some of the dominant languages of that country. But because the um, English speaking people were their main clients for the prostitutes and there were words for the different sexual acts in English that the prostitutes sold. Um, so English, one way or another, people learned English and they filed these incredible lawsuits. They're working with English speaking attorneys. And that was one of the first civil rights movements was to raise money um, for lawyers to represent the Chinese people because the Chinese like African-Americans and Native Americans were not allowed to testify in court. And so they had to be represented by white attorneys and speak with them. So I, I wanted to also share a comment that someone put in the chat. And they said, on a more positive note to this absolutely awful story, my husband was part Filipino who moved here with his mother and sister in the mid 40s. He attended Eureka Junior High and High School and was well received. The only other Asian he knew became his best friend for life, met the first day in gym class. Lenny went on to the Navy, then HSU teacher and counselor. 
he always said he would live no other place than humble. So that's really, really sweet story. Um, I think it's interesting too, because um, I don't think you mentioned it, but there were anti-Chinese policies for the city of Eureka. And Ben Chin was the first Chinese American to move back into the county in 19, mid-1950s, I think. Yeah, 56 and opened the restaurant. Yeah. And um, Ben Chin's son is on the mural, I believe. It's actually Ben Chin on the mural. It's Ben on the mural. And he's in, um, it was from World War II, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's in um, uniform. Other questions? We have that's a, me. Sorry. Uh, that's uh, all I have in my chat. Um, Kim, do you have any more? No, nope, that's all I see as well. Okay. Well, thank okay. you very much for coming today and for welcoming me and listening. And it's such a pleasure to be home in Humboldt County and to be working with this amazing group of people. And it's my first Ollie. So. Uh, well, thank you so much, okay Jean, you. and we'll look forward to hearing more from your new book with your new topic when you're ready to present that. You'll just have to let us know, and we'd be delighted to welcome you back. And I want to thank everyone who came and want to let you know that next Monday on January 31st, we have a presentation on the Warrior Institute, which is an Indigenous wellness initiative. Jude Marshall is from the Warrior Institute will tell us about the importance of supporting indigenous led wellness initiatives. The Warrior Institute envisions indigenous leaders who are grounded in the past and present who can implement solutions for the next seven generations. Learn about the Institute and explore opportunities for engagement and support. Thank you all. We're delighted to have you. Don't forget to look at your uh, catalog for the courses because they start this week and we've got lots of fun courses that you will enjoy and if you haven't had a chance to sign up to become members please do we need your support and people like myself I forgot to add my husband so I need to add him so we get one more it's this one at a time additions that we need to have happen it $35 isn't much for the exposure you get on all these lectures so um, but really, we really appreciate Jean and Vicki as well for your contribution today and looking forward to hearing from you again. Thank, Thank you, you again. so much. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Vicki. Excellent. I learned so much. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. Have a great week and look forward to seeing you in the next Holly event. Take care. All right. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.